So first up today, we have Quivera Coalition. Cool, we have Eva Stri Stri Stricker. I've been saying it all morning and still got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we have Eva Stricker, who is the director of the Carbon Ranch Initiative at Quivera Coalition and a soil eco ecologist. Who am I today? Cool, thanks guys. <laughs> and then we also have Sarah Winslow Fisher, who is the executive director of the Quivera Coalition. Um, but Sarah is a former co-op person who used to do Earth Fest for us. So welcome back, Sarah, in a different capacity. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Take it away. Great. All right. We're going to share screen soon, momentarily. And I think, yeah. All right. I'll let you start. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us this morning. I'm the executive director of the Kavira Coalition, and um, our organization builds resilience on uh, Western working landscapes. Um, working land means land that uh, folks make a living off of, um, just as a point of clarification, if that's not familiar language to you. Um, our organization uh, focuses on soil, biodiversity, and resilience, like on a lot of different scales. Um, those scales maybe are ecological, economic, and social. <laughs> and um, the way that we do our work, we work primarily with farmers and ranchers, but we also work with uh, technical service providers through different agencies like the New Mexico Department of Agriculture, the State Land Office, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and we design projects that are uh, really driven by the needs and interests of the folks who are the primary stewards of those working lands um, in partnership with those other folks who are technical service providers. Um, we do it through education, through trying to look at new ways to see the problem and innovate around it and through working together through collaboration. Um, we have, not all of our program areas are listed on this slide. It's a handful, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have, uh, Specifically, the programs that we operate are uh, an agricultural apprenticeship program. Um, it happens throughout the Western United States. Um, we, uh, as you may know, um, the average age of a farmer or rancher is 60 years old, and we have this sort of potential for loss of critical knowledge. Oops. Oh, the cat just changed the slide. <laughs> um, uh, and the way that we're addressing that is by putting career bound individuals um, in uh, apprenticeship situations on regenerative ranching operations throughout the West. Uh, we also have uh, an education program that um, organizes infield land-based workshops around specific types of uh, both knowledge and questions that farmers and ranchers have. Um, this program also organizes a large annual event about regenerative agriculture uh, it's called the Regenerate Conference, um, and that will happen again this year. We put that event on with Holistic Management International and the American Grassfed Association. Um, this program also does other things, like we have this amazing podcast called Down to Earth, oh, yeah. uh, which I, if you're a podcast listener, please check it out. Uh, Mary Charlotte Domendy is our host, and she interviews folks, uh, scientists, um, educators, farmers, ranchers, advocates, other folks who are all sort of asking big questions about the intersections of food systems, agriculture, and climate change. Um, and then we have our Carbon Ranch Initiative. <laughs> Great. And so uh, I joined about just over a year ago, and it's uh, one of the newer programs with Kavira, and we're tasked with broadly building soil carbon on working lands so that we're directly connecting producers uh, who have historically been blamed for some of the ill effects of climate change, we're connecting them with being a solution to climate change by pulling the carbon out and making their uh, lands more productive. So talk a little bit more about what we do. Uh, so a big organizing principle that we use uh, for our outreach and what drives our work are these healthy soil principles. So if you don't know, we're one of the few states that has um, state level legislation supporting people adopting healthy soil principles. So I put the link down below and we can pop it in the chat. 
And uh, there's, there's actually grant money associated um, and, and people can access that to make changes on their operations to increase soil health. Um, and so I have these up here. What I love about them is they're not prescriptive. So you're not forced to do no-till. You can minimize soil disturbance. So things like strip tillage or things like that are, are in line with the soil health principles where you're moving the needle towards soil health instead of away from it. Um, keep the soil covered, maximizing soil cover. That's to protect things from wind and water erosion. Likewise with soil, the cat's now drinking my water. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, likewise with the so minimizing soil disturbance, you're trying to keep the, the soil in place and keep it from moving out um, either in the wind or the water. And then the next three are all about feeding the, the soil microbes and making sure that the biology of the soil is really uh, alive. You know, so you can sort of bring to mind just like having a scoop of soil and smelling that life. Yeah, um, that's, I actually, you know, I'm a scientist, but I think that's a great way of telling if you have healthy soil in your garden is just smell it, you know, feel it. Does it, does it feel spongy? Does it feel moist? Uh, and all of that is so much driven by the microbes in there. So you wanna maximize the biodiversity on the top of the soil that can help you feed the diverse microbes below the soil. You wanna make sure that there's something alive all the time. So instead of, you know, a cover crop is a great way of keeping uh, something alive and, and feeding that soil all through the winter. And then integrating animals into land management is another key. That's also a way of maximizing biodiversity, but you, you, you know, we, uh, in the, in the legislation, they spell that out specifically. So uh, what does this have to do with compost? I think that compost fits in really nicely with a bunch of these up, up, up. soil health principles. Um, that was the, the whole start of our talk was why is compost aligned with healthy soil principles? Um, so putting compost down on the ground, you are actually covering the soil, right? Check. You, because it's a nutrient source, it's, it's a slow release fertilizer through the breakdown of these organic materials through natural decomposition processes. You're minimizing external inputs of fertilizer. Compost is full of those microbes. So you're maximizing biodiversity by putting that in. Um, I thought of another one, but I, anyway, like it's just, it's just great. It, compost is great. Oh, that's right. Um, if you're, if you're integrating compost into say a livestock operation and composting manure, that's another way of integrating animals into land management. Kitty, go that way. Um, I, I will say one thing, which is, you know, uh, I, I don't know who's on the call today, but you know, if you're, if you're a urbanite in Albuquerque and you have a, you know, a, a small yard, all of these things are still relevant. Um, you can be focused on soil health, even if you've got, you know, a five by five patch of dirt in your backyard. Um, compost application, animal integration can be, you know, the, the, the birds and the bees in your neighborhood or worms. So um, this, is, this is relevant beyond uh, bigger agriculture. Yeah, it's scalable across. And that's the other thing, it's not prescriptive. So you can still have your own goals and your own, like, you know, some of your goals is to make it look beautiful. And that's a wonderful goal. These still apply. Your goal could be to produce food. All of these still apply because soil is such that great nexus between so many social, ecological, and economic factors. All right. So, oh, kitty. <laughs> got the, I got the leg, the tail, the tail tickle. Um, so one of the pieces of the education that we've been doing is a lot with soil health. Um, one thing that we learned from some listening sessions with producers is that um, people weren't making changes to their operations. And we heard two different things and it's sort of a paradox. We heard, I don't know enough to make a change. And we heard, there's so much information that I don't know what's relevant to me. And to me, that sort of lit a light bulb that there's amazing soil health resources out there. There's people doing great work all across the world, right? But if you go on YouTube, you know, the, the top hit is out of Missouri or out of Cornell Lab in upstate New York. And we know in New Mexico that our soil just doesn't look like that. And so 
trying to figure out if what you're doing is right, but it, but the outcomes don't look like what you're seeing in the picture is really a challenge. And so we answered that with amazing partners, as, as Sarah mentioned, all of um, the extension, Healthy Soil Working Group, um, New Mexico Association of Conservation Districts, NRCS all contributed to this. Um, and so we've tried to make it super relevant to New Mexico. And so this is also freely available on our website. Feel free to print it um, and use it. Throw it in your truck. Take it's, it in your it's garden. A, it's a 150 page uh, manual that is designed for farmers and ranchers to be able to really literally and figuratively dig into soil health. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Um, great. And so one thing, another thing that you can do with whatever scale you're at is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientist, but my scientist hat on is monitor and evaluate, right? And that doesn't have to be anything too challenging. Take a photo at the same place in the same direction at the same time of year, and you're going to gain so much information. Write things down. <laughs> um, so there's all these ways of building in these practices so that you know what's changing and then you can start to hypothesize about what you're doing is leading to what change. Um, we also in the um, in the book we have instructions for more quantitative so assessing your ground cover by using a, a measuring tape and doing that same thing over and over throughout different years you're going to see if you're increasing the cover of vegetation or litter you can do some soil, soil stability tests. And then we talk about how to collect soils for lab tests and then send them off to get that information. So again, it's all scalable. You're very welcome to use this um, and hope, hopefully you find it helpful. All right, so then um, the next branch of the Carbon Ranch Initiative is research. So we're, we're doing the education to increase adoption of these behaviors and um, making changes. And then there's also the forefront of, of what's possible and what, what can we build next. And compost is just an amazing place, amazing vehicle for making all of these connections, social, ecological, and economic. So for example, we're actually sitting here at Polk Folly Farm today. Um, they're a great case study. They've, um, they have a swine operation and then twice a week, they take their 14 foot trailer down to either the Costco or the Roadrunner Food Bank. And the produce that's left over or expired um, is fed out to their pigs. So they're building, they're using urban waste to make food. And then when they clean the pig pens, which is something they have to do anyway, they're using that waste to produce compost, which they can then put out on their lands. So they're directly tying eaters in urban areas with new food production and then regenerating the soil through composting all at once. So it's a great case study of um, ways that compost can really be a nexus for so many good things in the world. Um, so you'll, you'll see on the right, this is an experiment we're doing out at Saul Ranch. I've got a video in a little bit that can talk a little bit more about it. But there's some really promising research out of California of the benefits of even a single application of compost for carbon uptake, for water um, holding capacity and all this. But what we don't know, and I'm gonna be really clear about what we don't know, is um, how that context applies in our really dry um, rangelands. So we know that it's, it's potentially good. We wanna, before we, scale it up and ask everybody to think about compost on their rangelands, we want to do some tests. So uh, that's a big effort in the last in the last couple of years is, is getting these tests done. All right. So um, we're going to watch some videos here. Um, and I'll talk through them okay, as great. we go. Yeah, because a bunch of them are silent. So let me go. Are y'all seeing that? I'm going to pause for a second and maybe uh, JR or Erica, can you give us a thumbs up if you can see the video? Yes, yeah. we can okay. see it. You Great. might want to uh, restart the share actually if you didn't check the uh, optimize for video. There's a little checkbox when you start the share. Oh, right. Okay. Otherwise, video is a little skippy. Okay. Let's see, optimize, optimize for video. video clip. 
great. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Screen share. Optimize for video. <laughs> oh, that's this one. one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that <laughs> what is going on? What are we seeing? What uh? uh... It's still loading, Sorry. so I can't. Uh. Can you stop share and try one more time. Let's see, where is it on here? It's it's in Google Chrome. Oh, I know what to do. So I think we close out of, oh, it's like, it's like on your, yeah, there you go. It's like over there somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay, let me hit escape here and do a screen share. And what do I choose, Chrome? Yeah, there you go. Share. <laughs> Okay, are we good? Can everybody see it? Yes. Fantastic. That's looking okay. good. Thank you. All right, so here's, you just saw this, the happy pigs. Uh, compost heats things up. You're, you're killing weed seeds, you're killing pathogens. This is an aerated static pile down at Reunity in Santa Fe. And they use uh, literally a bouncy house blower to get the aeration. We're also partnering with Reunity to talk about um, worm composting. So we have workshops coming up in Edgewood in July. So let us know if you want to come learn more about how to make a larger scale. You know, there's the backyard composting and then there's this gets a little bit larger scale. Um, and so it's been fantastic to work with them. Um, so with, yeah. the, with uh, that particular program, I think we're thinking about you know, folks who are going to need to use it for restoration purposes or for commercial purposes. So really like scaling up the community of practice around compost production in the state. So here's one in an orchard and adding um, berry on top. I also call myself the, the compost fairy now because everywhere I go, I put little squares of compost in the desert. <laughs> so this is down south in more um, creosote shrubland. So again, this is the research part. We don't know what's going to happen. Hope it works well. <laughs> but um, I also wonder what other people think I'm up to. It's pretty funny. So this one, um, oh, the sound's not coming through. Please oh, I, unmute. Yeah, I, yeah, I can unmute. Sorry. So something everyone asked me is if compost will just blow away as soon as you put it down. And this is like 50 mile an hour winds. <laughs> And it's still there, which made me very happy because I didn't know if it would all blow away either. Here's some initial results we've got. Um, this is drone footage, actually also here at Polk's Folly. Um, not intentional, but you can see the green um, squares are, are where we put compost. And I haven't identified every plant species yet because it's too early in the season, but I do know at least it's not cheatgrass, so it's not just a horrible invasive species. Um, this is a fertilization effect, of course, but it's uh, it's nice to see that something is happening even in the first couple of months, even in a drought. So, and this one is, this one should have sound. I think I talk over this one, so I don't need to. So I get another question I often get is maybe pause it because I think I'll start talking in a second. There we go. Uh, another question I get is how do you actually spread compost, and are you going to try to put compost over an entire hundred thousand acre ranch? And I say no, but use landowner land steward knowledge of what might be a place that's beneficial. So um we'll see when when the drone footage starts going up but it's an area that just is not doing as well there was a road put in and we think that reduced how much water got to the to the downslope side of the road uh and so the the land steward was like this is a place i want to try to get going and use it as a seed source to reseed outside of this area um so you don't have to put compost everywhere is one point how do you get it out there's a couple of different methods. The old 
shovel out the back of a truck works just fine. It's slow, but there's no great costs. There's a manure spreader, which is more input costs, much faster. And then there's actually um, blower trucks where you can blow the compost out. That's the most expensive, but you're getting it over a large area. So there's all these different considerations for and all of this ongoing research of what's the best way for which context and, and all that. So this is one Stricker research project. I'm the director of the Carbon Ranch Initiative at Kibira Coalition. We are doing a Western stair project with um, Holt's Folly Farm. And the idea is to introduce organic material into rangeland. We're not going to try to put compost over the entire yeah, thing. Uh, but pick a really spot that's this. not doing quite as well. You can kind of see that the grass over there is nicer than the grass right here, and then it gets nicer again. So trying to figure out what we can do about this spot and, and build up its productivity and its soil health. Uh, we've collected lots of baseline monitoring already, uh, and now this is the exciting day of actually putting out compost. Um, and so we're we're also testing different amounts of compost because that's sort of an unknown for dry rangeland because we don't actually know um, what's an efficient amount. Do we do we need a whole inch? That's what this plot is going to get, and then we have a half an inch and a quarter of an inch. And so hopefully we'll get really nice outcomes at the quarter inch application rate, which would be less. I mean, people can more realistically um, get compost out and be ready for uh, ready for better soil health. There you go. Cool. All right. I guess that, oh, look at us. We were like two minutes over. We hadn't had. That was it. Okay. Yeah. I think so we can, we can talk about that later if uh, people have questions. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. So yeah, maybe we'll stop there. And uh, I don't know if we're going to take questions now or if other speakers are going to speak and then ask questions. So we'll have some time for uh, shared questions at the end, but we do have time for some questions just for you right now. And I have a whole bunch, but uh, I want to give other people uh, plenty of chance too. So uh, if you have a question, please let us know in chat, or there is a, a Q&A function here in Zoom or you can use the raise hand function and we can unmute your mic if you want to ask over voice. But to get started, oh gosh, uh, which one should I pick? You cover so much really interesting information. Um, I guess one thing uh, I'm curious about is how this does apply to people who are uh, working on you know, home gardens, smaller scale. Cause I know you said that is, you know, that's, that, that's possible. How does somebody go about doing that? Does your soil health workbook uh, have information for the home gardener as well, or how does that work? I'm gonna say that, um, yes, that it, it, it will be relevant. Um, we talk about how to find soil maps. So, you know, you know, like I'm down right by the river. I have incredibly clay soil up here. We have much sandier. There's parts, you know, up in the foothills, that's rocky. So you sort of know the context. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, then I would definitely also say, because Steffi asked, would we do some research at, at your house? Uh, we don't have to drive that. I mean, just by saying, okay, on this, on this plot, I'm going to try this much compost. And on this plot, I'm going to try something else. You're doing research and, uh, you're driving the, driving the story. What I, what we always say is like, we, and Sarah mentioned this at the beginning, we don't come in and like say, this is what we're gonna try. We listen to who we're um, on the land of and what their interests are. And then we, it, so it's like a, it's a bottom up process and then we match it with the tools that we have. But so many of the tools that we have are actually tools that everyone has, which is like a small shovel and a tape measure. So um, definitely encourage everybody to, to get out and, and play. Um, because it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have um, decades of formal training for the, to learn a lot and to, to make a big difference in, in your knowledge and your soil. And I will say like compost production can also happen at a household scale and it's challenging for people here because we, it's so dry. Um, I tried to compost in my house for years and it just sort of turns into a big desiccated pile. Um, but I think that there are methods like a Bokashi method or a worm bin that actually are super effective and a good scale for a household, which then can go into a home garden. Um, and I think thinking about things like 
how are you creating diversity in your garden, uh, as well as how are you um, thinking about what kinds of annual plants do you want to put in where you're going to disturb your soil and what kinds of perennial plants can you put in uh, to uh, not be disturbing your soil. Um, those are all good questions that scale really well to the household level. <laughs> um, there's a question I see here about uh, cover crops to use in a home garden. Um, and this is totally anecdotal from my own <laughs> garden, um, but I think that things that uh, I've uh, that have worked well are um, an annual ryegrass, uh, certain types of clover, um, tiller radishes, which are daikon radishes, which are then also edible. Um, those are all uh, really good cover crops. Um, and I think it just depends on the scale of your garden. So um, cover crops work well in a small garden and I encourage you to, to use them um, and then just read up on when you need to plant them. Some you need to plant in the fall before and some you'll need to plant in the early spring uh, depending on what the plant is. And there's so many great resources um, in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So master gardener programs, um, master composter programs are really great for the backyard scale because um, they, they're experts. And then the uh, extension, NMSU Extension has so many great resources. So we are certainly not trying to do everything and we will point you toward, you know, feel free to ask us and we may point you towards the other people who've been doing this work for a long time. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a question here about use of compost tea. Um, mm -hmm. And there is some interesting research happening in Montana looking at compost tea application, but a few of my soil science friends say that it's very hard to determine if it's um, just that it's additional moisture <laughs> being added or if the microbes are actually benefiting the soil. Um, but it's a good question. And I think that there are folks who are actively exploring that. It's not something we're exploring, but we are exploring other types of uh, biological amendment. So um, in addition to Eva's compost research, she is also doing some biochar <laughs> yep. research, which presents a really interesting opportunity for uh, pairing a need for forest thinning in particular areas of our state where we have too much fuel load in our public lands, in our um, BLM and forest or service lands. our watershed up, upstream of, you know, where we need to drink from. <laughs> yep, and, yeah. and that the, uh, uh, you know, fuel that's being harvested from there that's not good for firewood or for timber can be turned into biochar that then can be applied to rangeland. And we're gonna take similar measurements to the uh, compost application. So um, that's another thing that we're, we're doing because it, it is interesting to think about all of the places where we have a potential waste source for doing something positive on the land. Yeah, pairing something that was waste, you have to deal with it already and using that to just put right back into the soil. Um, and, and again, the caveat is all of this is at the research stage. Um, I hope I've emphasized that I do not wanna be prescriptive and tell everyone that they need biochar. I am definitely encouraging people to research more for their own context. And if you're interested, try it small before you do a huge change. So because, it's, because we're very cutting edge on this, because we don't know what's gonna happen in the dryland context where we are. So just my little disclaimer real quick. Thank you. So how would we keep up with the findings of your research as it continues? So just check your website and see the updates yeah, we there. Have, we have a newsletter. We, we promise we don't um, bombard you too much. Lots of it is pretty pictures. Um, and then we do, uh, as, we, as we have findings or workshops or things that are interested, we'll send them out just once a month, twice a month, just kidding, twice a month, <laughs> and get, a, get a newsletter from us. Um, yeah, and you can sign up on our website. Okay, great. All right. We still have just a couple minutes. Oh, sorry. I, cut you oh, I was just going to say, we, you know, we also have social media channels on oh, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and periodically LinkedIn. Um, and, and additionally, we have like tons of YouTube videos. Yeah. So if you're interested in this and you want to dive in, YouTube is a great source. And then we've taken those YouTube videos, a lot of them are talks like this, and translated them to audio files on SoundCloud. So uh, if you want to be working in your garden and listening to stuff like this, you can uh, find us there as well. That's super cool. All right. Uh, we do still have a couple minutes here. If anybody else has other questions, let us know in chat. Um, I had another question here. So how do you balance this with water usage? You know, cover crops are thirsty. How does that work in a place like this? Um, yeah, uh, that's the 
billion dollar question. Right? <laughs> um, so the, yes, so there is a water cost of making a lot of these changes, but the, the feedback is going in the right direction that as you build soil health, you're actually decreasing water needs is that is the ideal because you're building that soil organic material that's taking up the water more quickly and holding it in the soil. And so um, I'm, I'm not going to disagree that, I mean, and compost takes water. That's the other problem, right? And we just have to balance and at what scale is relevant for, um, for what's worth doing. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's definitely a longer term gain. You know, it's, um, you're not gonna, you're, well, I, I won't guarantee that you won't see a change after one or two years, but probably after a decade, you're gonna see some pretty um, meaningful changes if you're, if you're working towards the soil health principles. But yeah, it, it's, it's certainly, hence the monitoring and making sure you're taking photos because the first you're like, oh, I did all this work and nothing happened. You might not see it yet. And it, it, it's probably happening at a slightly longer time scale, especially in a drought. Everything is gonna be slower in a drought. So, so don't give up, keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, right. I think that, that, you know, like strategic investment of your water in helping to build soil health uh, helps that water uh, retention over time uh, at a level where plants can utilize it, um, which, you know, it, in the bigger picture, I think is improving the hydrologic cycle. So. Pays up in the end. All right. Yeah. There was a new question in the chat. Are there any uh, recommended podcasts that you'd have about this? I assume beyond, of course, your podcast. Yes. Um, I'll start adding them into the chat as I think about them. I feel nice. like uh, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I actually still have to the chat. another minute here. Um, I guess, and there's probably not enough time to really get into this completely, but I'm curious with a case like Pokes Folly, where, uh, you know, they're, they're sourcing uh, produce from places like Costco. I'm sure that it can't be certified organic, but I, I am also sure that in some ways it's, you know, better than some certified organic operations. How, uh, how do consumers know, uh, you know, what to buy? Is there, I know there's no easy label that just says regenerative. I'm sure that's very complicated. Well, it, that's a that's a great question. Great question, yeah. Um, so I, there uh, there are a number of different entities that are trying to establish some sort of regenerative certification, um, but it's a complex question because it is so context specific, um, and I think that there are, are principles about this that like are principles that the co-op has had for long before they started talking about regenerative agriculture um, or even started carrying organic products, which is like, know where your food comes from. <laughs> and you know, the, the closer you can be to the source and you can ask questions about it, the better. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell if the claims that say like the whole foods meat uh, counter are making are really genuine. I mean, they make a huge effort for that certification process, but it's hard to know and you can't necessarily call up that rancher or that farmer and ask them questions where if, uh, you know, you're buying meat from Polk's Folly, you can walk into their farm stand and say, what's going on? And they can, you know, pull up a bunch of pictures on their phone and be like, this is what we're feeding our pigs. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and I think that that applies to a lot of the, um, uh, you know, producers that La Montanita carries as well. Um, so that's what I would say is, you know, ask, um, ask yeah. good questions and, you know, try to uh, really understand um, who's producing your food and how they're doing it. Uh, yeah. And then like Reunity, I know they, they are very careful because people really care. And so they've worked for a decade to establish relationships. Like they know this stable feeds their horses organic hay and so when they get a load from that stable that goes into a separate pile and so it's not certified but those relationships have um have built up as much of a certainty as as um we have right now so so yeah just like sarah said it's about relationships and anytime that people can get out especially you know COVID times we can sort of be outside if you if if there's farm or ranch visits that are available 
um, and getting to have some of those conversations it would be really amazing. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's a lot of farmers, if you went and said, tell me about your soil health, that they would be really excited to talk to you they, about it. They will talk to you about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here today. That's really informative. And uh, uh, keep an eye in chat where you can scroll up for links to the podcast, other pages, and uh, we'll we'll get some other links posted there as well. Thank you again so much. Thank you for thank having you guys. us.